The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Keep silence. Keep silence before Him. Hear now the word of the Lord from Psalm 100 in metric form. Shout to the Lord with joy, all who to earth belong. Adore the Lord with joyful hearts and come to Him in song. Know that the Lord is God. He made us as His own. We are the sheep for whom He cares, His people, His alone. Enter His gates with praise, His courts with thankfulness. Your praises gladly sing to Him, His name forever bless. For God the Lord is good, His love is ever sure. His constant truth and faithfulness through every age endure. Thus far the reading of God's word. Good morning to all of you. It is my prayer that all of you are safe and healthy. And again, I would like to welcome you to our online worship here at Pilgrim Community Church. We do not normally broadcast our worship services online because we believe that worship service is done in the physical assembly of the people of God. Now, you may have heard about Pilgrim Community Church. And at Pilgrim Community Church, we endeavor to be known for at least three things. And these are printed on the first page of your bulletin. And they are as follows. First, to be Christ-centered. Second, to be gospel-shaped. And third, to be known as a Together for Good Church. First, as a Christ-centered church. We believe that Christianity centers around its Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. That Christianity is not about the way of life, a way of ethics that we have to do, but it centers around what the, who the person of the Lord Jesus is and what He did on the cross for sinners like us. Secondly, a gospel-shaped church. We believe that the gospel message has implications in the way we think, in the way we speak, in the way we behave and that is why we align our lives in accordance to the implications of the gospel message and lastly we wanted to be known as a together for good church together for good means two things together that we are here for each other that we are here to edify correct and rebuke one another in order for us to get to know the lord better and for us to live holy lives in His presence. Secondly, together for good means that we are here for the community, that we are here to seek the shalom of the city. Again, Pilgrim Community Church stands for being a Christ-centered church, a gospel-shaped church, and a together for good church. Again, welcome, and may I invite all of you uh, to pray with me as we continue our worship this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that uh, despite the enhanced quarantine that we are experiencing right now, that you have provided for us all the means, the resources to continue to worship, to gather your people, to hear your voice. We ask, O oh Lord, that may you continue to guide us this morning, and may our worship service this morning be pleasing to you. Thank you, Father. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. We are now in the, uh, you will now be singing our congregational song. Uh, we will be singing uh, Psalm 46 in the tune of uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And this is also printed on your bulletin. 
Let's sing. God is our refuge and our strength, a present help in our distress. We will not therefore be afraid, though all the earth should be removed. Though mountains great be hurled into the ocean's depths, though seas may roar and foam, and be though shake the shore, though mountains tremble at their power, a river brings refreshing streams to cheer the city of our God. The most high's holy dwelling place, God is in her, she won't be moved. At dawn will God help her, the nation's rich rooms quake. He lifts his voice, earth melts, the Lord of hosts with us. Our fortress strong is Jacob's God. O oh, come see what the Lord has done, He desolations brought on earth. On earth He puts an end to wars, Breaks bow and spear and chariots burns. Be still now, I am God, exalted or all men, exalted over all earth, the Lord of hosts with us. Our fortress strong is Jacob's God. We are now in the confessing our sins portion of our worship. The Lord says in Psalm 103, verses 13 to 14, He says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear Him. For He knows our frame, He remembers that we are dust. At this point in our worship, we will be confessing our sins before the Lord. And as we do so, we will be guided by the words of the De Decalogue. May we continue to reflect upon the words of the Decalogue as we evaluate our life as to what sins we have committed throughout the week. Hear now the words of the Decalogue in metric form. You shall not have more gods than me, before no image bow the knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor dare the Sabbath to profane. Give both your parents honor due. Take heed that you no murder do. Abstain from words and deeds unclean, nor steal though you are poor and weak. Nor make a willful lie, nor love it. What is your neighbor's, do not covet. Let us now take some time to privately confess our sins before the Lord, and afterwards we will be praying the words of the corporate confession printed in our bulletin. Let us now humbly come before the Lord. Uh, in repentance and confession. with a repentant heart and with our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us now pray the corporate confession. Let us pray. Holy Father, you see us as we are and know our inmost thoughts. We confess that we are unworthy of your gracious care. 
we forget that all life comes from you and that to you all life returns. We have not sought to do your will with our whole hearts. We have not lived as grateful children, nor loved as Christ loved us. Apart from you, we are nothing. Only your grace can sustain us. Lord, in your mercy forgive us, heal us, and make us whole. Set us free from our sin, and restore us to the joy of your salvation, now and forever. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, as we have read earlier in Psalm 103, it reminds us that the Heavenly Father is compassionate to His children. And how do we become children of God? It's because we are united by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He promised that those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are children of God. And because of his compassion towards his children, the passage continues to remind us that the Lord will continue to show compassion to those who fear him. Those who fear him uh, refers also to the, to the children of God, to those who have placed their faith in Christ. And so if this morning you have repented of your sin, know for sure that your sins have been forgiven. However, if you are just tuning, for the first, tuning in for the first time and you do not know what the confession of sins mean, I tell you, you're, you continue to be a rebellious person before the Lord and you will someday receive God's justice. And so that is why this morning I would encourage you, if you are not yet a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, Repent from your sin and turn away from it. Place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your only Savior. And if you have placed your faith in Christ, I would then urge you to go and sin no more. With that assurance, the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us. Even though we fail, because the Lord continues to show compassion to His children. We will now proceed with our giving thanks for God's mercies. Uh, during this time, we usually pass the offering bag, but because we are all in our respective homes, that will be impossible for us to do that. That is why we have printed the bank details of uh, the Pilgrim Community Church uh, in your bulletin. We hope and pray that you will be able to uh, make a bank transfer uh, to support the ministry. Uh, if you are tuning again, tuning in for the first time, if you are a visitor and you, it's your first time to watch uh, our broadcast, our sermon broadcast, uh, please do not feel obliged to do anything uh, in making a bank transfer. We believe that uh, financial giving is a responsibility of our church members. Now for some announcements, let us continue to pray for our country. Uh, it's supposed to be the, the quarantine, peri quarantine period was originally to be lifted by April 14 or 15, but we have heard from the recent uh, announcement of um, the Malacanang Palace that the uh, quarantine period has been extended and we have also seen an increasing number as to the reported cases uh, of people who had been affected by this uh, COVID-19 virus. So let us also pray uh, for its containment. Let us also pray for our frontliners. Let us also continue to pray for the people around us. I know that uh, this is a uh, extreme uh, situation that we are all in uh, there are there's a lot of uncertainties and anxieties so let us continue to uphold each other in prayer now before we proceed to the healing of god's word uh, let us again come before the lord in prayer heavenly father we thank you lord that out of the seven days lord we still have this one full day 
sanctified for you, sanctified for our soul to rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we have become your children by your grace and mercy. And we ask, O oh Lord, that, uh, may you guide us and may our worship this morning be pleasing to you. May also guide the preacher this morning that he may be able to declare your word and not just the opinion of, every, of any man. I pray, Lord, that may you continue to speak in our hearts, may you remove anything that is hindering us from listening to your word. We ask, O oh Lord, that may you continue to guide us. And as we ask, O oh Lord, that may you humble our hearts. May you grant us a teachable heart, O oh Lord. Speak to, to, you, to us, O oh Lord, for your children are listening. Thank you, Father, for praying these things through Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. Uh, this is the text from which our sermon is based. Daniel chapter 7, verses uh, 1 to 28. Hear now the word of the Lord from Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 to 28. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven were steering up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the, be and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stumped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, in the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body uh, destroyed, and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed as for me daniel my spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me i approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things these four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth but the saints of the most high shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever forever and ever then i desired to know the truth about the fourth beast which was different from all the rest exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet and about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions as i looked this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the most high and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom thus he said as for the fourth beast there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all the kingdoms and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces as for the ten horns out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise and another shall arise after them they shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings he shall speak words against the most high and shall wear out <coughs> the saints of the most high and shall think to, to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time times and half a time but the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high his kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him here's the end of the matter as for me daniel my thoughts greatly alarmed me and my color changed but i kept the matter in my heart thus far the reading of god's word thanks be to god a man in a north korean prison camp is shaken awake after being beaten unconscious the beatings begin again and then a group of children are laughing and talking as they come down to their church's sanctuary after having some snacks instantly upon entering the sanctuary of their church many of them are killed by a bomb blast it was easter sunday in sri lanka when the bomb exploded these people do not live in the same country however they share the same characteristics and that is they are all christians they suffer because of their faith while christian persecution takes many forms it is defined as any hostility experienced as a result of identification with jesus christ from sudan to russia from nigeria to north korea from colombia to india followers of jesus christ are targeted for their faith they are attacked they are discriminated in at work and at school they risk sexual violence torture arrest and death in 2019 according to the open doors website over 260 million christians live in places where they experience high levels of persecution 2,900 
83 Christians were killed for their faith. And at about 9,488 churches and Christian buildings were attacked. Some of us actually know about Pastor Wang Yi that last December 2019, uh, he was sentenced to suffer nine years of uh, imprisonment. He was given such a prison sentence without the assistance of a legal counsel. His crime? To only ask for the national leaders of China to repent of their sins and to place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the only crime that he committed. Now, these stories of persecution, these accounts, these statistics are actually heartbreaking. And yet they do not tell us the whole story. Just like in our passage this morning, we came to learn that the people of God experience oppression from tyrants and evil communities at large. When the situation seemed to favor the oppressors, God drew a vision, reminded Daniel that God remains to be in control. He is on the throne and continues to hold history in his hands. And that is why I have entitled our sermon this morning as God on the throne. Our passage this morning, in particular Daniel chapter 7, we, are, we can see that God's rule extends over fallen human kingdoms and it is also seen in the coronation or installation of a cosmic divine king and lastly in God's rendition of a judgment. Now you may have noticed that chapter 7 has some similarities with chapter 2. Well, admittedly there are similarities but there are also differences. But first we have to recognize the fact that chapters 2 to 7 were written in Aramaic and were presented by the author in a chiastic structure. In chapter 2, it talks about the prophetic vision of the four-part statue. You have the head of gold, no? you have the chest and the arms of, uh, of silver, and then in the middle portion, there's the bronze, the leg of iron, and then the feet of uh, clay and, and mixture of clay and iron. And that's chapter 2. Now, in chapter 3, uh, we learned about God's deliverance of uh, His people. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then in chapter 4 and 5, uh, we can see, or in particular first in chapter 4, uh, God saves Nebuchadnezzar. And then in chapter 5, uh, we can see uh, God's judgment upon the kingdom of Babylon. God's judgment to uh, King Belshazzar. And chapters 4 and 5 are actually at the peak of this chiastic structure. And in both chapters, we can see God's sovereignty over his people's oppressor. And if you have uh, learned about the chiastic structure, it is the most important message is actually found at the pinnacle or the climax of this uh, chiastic structure. So in a chiastic structure, uh, the author actually builds his argument inductively until he reaches his main point which is at the center of the chiasm structure and then upon reaching this focal point of the chiastic structure the author will then uh, build his argument deductively so there are you can see that there are parallelisms okay so that is chapter four and five at the center of the chiastic structure and then uh, deductively in chapter 6, uh, again, you can see uh, the oppression that the, or the persecution against the people of God, which actually parallels with uh, chapter 3. Okay? In chapter 3, there's Shaddak, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, in chapter 6, it's Daniel himself who experiences the persecution. And then, in chapter 7, which also parallels with chapter 2, uh, we read about the uh, uh, the vision of the four beasts okay so if there are similarities okay there as we have said there are also differences okay the difference the differences lie uh, to the fact that in chapter 2 it was uh, Nebuchadnezzar 
who received the dream, while in chapter 7, uh, it was Daniel who received the vision in the night. And then in uh, chapter 2, the focus is on the powers of the human kingdoms. But in chapter 7, the emphasis is placed on the depravity of human kingdoms, the depravity of human powers. Which then brings us to our first point, that God's rule extends over fallen human kingdoms. And for children, the key word here is power. Okay, It's power. Now in verse 1, uh, it tells us the occasion and time when Daniel received his dream. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Now in chapter 5, we have already learned that Belshazzar was the last ruler of the kingdom of Babylon. Okay? And it was also during his time that the kingdom fell into the hands of the Medo-Persian kingdom. Now, again, who's uh, additional information uh, about uh, Belshazzar? Well, uh, Belshazzar, again, he was the last ruler of Babylon. He was also the co-regent of Nob Nabonidus, his father. So while Nabonidus is away from the palace, he's busy with his uh, military expansion, with, with his military expedition, uh, Belshazzar was actually left in the palace to manage the day-to-day -day operations. Okay. So it was during uh, Belshazzar's time, that uh, first year of uh, Belshazzar's reign, that uh, Daniel uh, received the vision. Okay. And verse 1 continues with, uh, Daniel uh, saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. And then he wrote down the dream and saw the sum of the matter. Daniel wrote down the summary or the facts about uh, what he saw in his dream. Uh, the act of writing down the substance of his, of his dream implies that... Uh, what God revealed to Daniel is God's written revelation for his people and for the entire humanity. Okay? And that is the importance of uh, why uh, Daniel wrote down uh, his vision. Because he wanted to uh, share uh, about his vision to the people of God. And not just to them, no? but also to the uh, people at large, to, to all the people. So what exactly did he see in his vision? Well, first, he saw the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. Now, the four winds suggest comprehensiveness. Okay? Uh, it refers to the four directions of the, the earth. Okay? It means that the winds are coming from all directions. And then the phrase uh, of heaven implies the control of God over the situation. It also echoes the Spirit of God in the book of Genesis, who willing above the waters. Now, in short, it tells us that uh, there's nothing accidental in God's world, that everything is within God's control. Now, let's go back to the winds. What were these uh, four winds doing? Where, well, they were actually stirring up the great sea. Now we can just imagine uh, Daniel standing at the seashore and looking at the turbulent sea with big waves crashing on the shore. Now on a psychological level, the turbulent sea okay, signals danger. But there's something more that meets the eye. Now during the time of Daniel, the sea is already considered to be a symbol for evil, chaos, and destruction. It can also signify a fallen and disordered world. Now, in Babylon, where Daniel actually is serving as a government uh, official, we have this famous mythical epic called the Enuna Elish. Now, in that story, Apsu wanted to eradicate his children, who were also Babylonian uh, gods. Now, Apsu's uh, wife named uh, Tiamat, and the name Tiamat means sea, 
uh, protested uh, against uh, APSU's uh, plan of eradicating the, their children. And so the plan to eradicate the other gods actually reached Eya, the goddess of wisdom. And Eya uh, was able to actually subdue and kill Apsu. When Tiamat, the sea, uh, learned about the death of Apsu, he wanted, she wanted to avenge uh, her husband. Okay? Unfortunately for, this, for the other gods and for Eya, they were not uh, powerful enough to defeat Tiamat. They, were, they stood powerless uh, against her. Now, Marduk came to the rescue and was able to kill Tiamat, uh, the sea. Nonetheless, uh, the sea continues to pose danger to the entire creation. So what Marduk did was to set boundaries no, to keep the world from being destroyed by the sea and from reverting back to its original state of being void and formless. Now that's in the Babylonian worldview. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, we can also read uh, Yahweh's uh, victory against the evil forces as recounted in his constant battle or fight against the sea and, it, in, and its uh, monsters. Now with this background information, we can sense Daniel's feeling of horror when he saw the big waves and the turbulence happening in the sea. He might be telling himself, I think I'm already seeing the end of the world. Just place yourself in the shoes of Daniel, that you're given the opportunity to see how the world will end. Now, to aggravate the matter, we are, we are also told that Daniel saw certain beasts coming out of the great sea. So, Daniel recounts to us uh, uh, in specific, in specific, uh, inform, gives us a specific information uh, about this uh, beast. No? Uh, in verse 3, we are told uh, that uh, for the four beasts came up out of the sea, which are actually different uh, from one another. And as we continue reading the, the, the passage uh, up to verse 8, we, we will notice that the uh, appearance of these beasts are different. They are actually striking. Okay. Uh, by way of general observation, we can see we can say that these animals or creatures do not really exist and we can also except for at least the second beast which is actually a, a bear and we will also notice that uh, these creatures are actually hybrid animals no uh, they are combinations of uh, different features of different animals okay so, being a hybrid animal, we can say that this is a form of, uh, ab there's an abnormality, okay? Because in the book of Genesis, uh, we are told that God created all animals according to their kind, according to their species. In, in other words, uh, there should be no mutation or hybridity in creation. But our passage tells us that Daniel actually saw hybrid animals, so, what's the point of the hybridity? Well, it tells us that there's an abnormality. It also tells us that this animal are of a different kind in the sense that they actually defy God's created order. Okay? Aside from being a symbol for defiance of God's created order, uh, we can also say that these animals are actually evil because they came out of the sea which symbolizes uh, evil now let's go back to our passage no so what are these uh, beasts that uh, uh, daniel actually saw well the first beast we are told in verse 4 that uh, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings 
Then as he looked, uh, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. No? And the mind of a man was actually given uh, to it, to or to the to first beast. Okay. Now, the lions and eagles uh, are considered to be proud animals. They strike fear uh, to other animals, especially to their prey. So that's the first beast that uh, Daniel saw, a combination of the lion and eagle. Now, the second beast in verse 5, we are told, And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. Okay? Now, we can observe uh, with regard to this second beast that uh, the, the bear actually had a voracious appetite. Okay? Now, for the third beast, in verse 6, After this, I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was actually given to it. Okay? Now, the leopard uh, is known for its speed. It is known to be the fastest moving animal in the ancient world. What is also interesting is that uh, this uh, leopard, <coughs> aside from the fact that it has uh, four heads, it also had four wings. Okay? Just imagine that uh, under normal circumstances, it, it can already move at a fast pace. How much more that it has been given with uh, uh, four wings, no? Uh, the, the speed could have doubled or possibly ca we can also say quadrupled, okay? Now, for the fourth beast, okay, it was described as to be fearsome, to be different from the other be three beasts, okay? We are also told that the fourth beast, uh, again, was a terrifying uh, dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great uh, iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stopped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. Uh, and then uh, Daniel continues that uh, the, the fourth beast uh, had uh, ten horns. And then he said that the horns, uh, in verse 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up uh, among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of men, and the mouth speaking great things. Okay? Uh, we will notice that uh, the fourth beast was not actually identified with any living animals. It was described just as a beast uh, which is actually ferocious than the other beast that preceded it. That it had, uh, again, huge iron teeth which suggests a military power or militarism. We are told, uh, we can also say that it is ruthless uh, since uh, the passage tells us that the uh, fourth beast will not allow any survivors. It will stamp anything that survives from what it has already devoured through its iron uh, teeth. Okay. Then the ten horns. Uh, the horns actually represent power and pride. And then there's an eleventh horn uh, which have the eyes like that of a man and that it has a mouth that it can speak uh, arrogantly. Okay. Now, what do these beasts symbolize? Okay. Now, in verse 17 of chapter 7, we are told, these four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. Okay. This tells uh, the path now, this uh, passage tells us that uh, Daniel was given uh, a panoramic view of world empires. No? That evil kingdoms will succeed one another. 
in the ancient world, no, the in, the the nations were actually identified with uh, ferocious animals, and these animals that symbolizes them uh, describe their power and the ethos of their nation. So, if the beast actually refers to actual kingdoms and kings that will succeed one another, then who are they, no? Who are these kingdoms and kings being referred to uh, in the vision? Now, with regard to the first beast, no? the lion with the eagle's wing, wings, uh, it refers to uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? It refers to the Babylonian kingdom. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 7, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was actually described as a lion. It reads, A lion has gone up from his thicket. A destroyer of nations has set out. He has gone out from his place to make your land a waste. Your cities will be ruins without inhabitant. So that's Nebuchadnezzar being described as a lion. Now the prophet Ezekiel uh, now described the Babylonian kingdom like that of an eagle. Okay? In Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 3 and verse 12. In verse 3 it says, Say thus says the Lord God, A great eagle with great wings and long pinions rich in plumage of many colors came to Lebanon and took the top of the cedar. And then in verse 12, we are told, Say now to the rebellious house, do you not know what these things mean? Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and took her king and princess and brought them to him, to Babylon. So, we can see that uh, both imageries are actually uh, given to ba the Babylonian kingdom and to King Nebuchadnezzar as uh, the lion with eagle's wings. Now, Daniel also observed that the lion's uh, wings were actually plucked out from its root. Okay? So what does it symbolize? Okay? Uh, it means the, it refers to the humiliation of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar as we have seen in chapter 4. Then he also saw that the lion or the first beast was uh, made to stand on two feet like a man and the mind of a man was given to it. Okay? Now, the, the act of making the first beast stand like a man and that a mind is given to, of a man given to it refers to the restoration of King Nebuchadnezzar, which we also saw in chapter 4. So that's the first beast, the lion with the eagle's wings, referring to uh, the Babylonian kingdom. Now, how about the second beast? Okay. The second beast, the bear, with the three leaves uh, uh, in its mouth, okay. uh, the bear refers to the Medo-Persian kingdom. Now, the historical reference as to the three ribs in its mouth continues to be the subject of discussion among Bible scholars. Now, some scholars think that the, that the three ribs actually refer to the three kingdoms that had been subdued by the Medo-Persian kingdoms, namely uh, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. Now, on the other hand, there are also scholars who say that the three ribs actually refers to the three alliances of uh, of the Middle Persian Kingdom uh, when it actually subdued or destroyed the Babylonian Kingdom. But uh, again, uh, the passage actually, our passage uh, is actually rich in symbolism and imagery. And the point uh, being given to us by the passage is that the Middle Persian Kingdom has an has a voracious appetite for power and destruction. Okay? The emphasis is actually being placed on the voracious nature of the beast. Now, the third beast, okay, 
the leopard with the four heads and four wings as we have already identified uh, earlier or said earlier that uh, 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 the leopard actually has uh, is actually the, the fastest animal uh, in the ancient world okay uh, it symbolizes the Greek Empire okay uh, it's it's very an apt uh, imagery to describe the fast-paced uh, spread of the Greek Empire through the leadership of Alexander uh, the Great okay so the fourth beast the leopard with the uh, with four heads and four wings refer to uh, the Greek Empire now as to the fourth beast the the, the ferocious the, the the terrible beast uh, described which is actually different from the other three beasts, refers to the Roman Empire. Okay? Now, what do these uh, imageries or human kingdom, on human kingdoms and empire teach us about human power? Okay? Since the, the beast actually refers to actual kingdoms and empires. Well, first, it tells us the, that the nature of uh, human power, okay? Uh, as we have seen, uh, all of the beasts came out from the Great Sea, okay? Which symbolized chaos, destruction, and the fallen human world. Further, we can notice that the symbolic animals, okay, uh, are characterized as being proud, arrogant, voracious hungry for power and violence and they are actually ruthless so that's the first thing that we can learn about the the imageries of the beast it tells us about the nature of human power secondly it reminds us that fallen human power are not absolute the first beast uh, to the last beast we can read that their powers have limitations with regard to the first beast, its eagle's wings were actually plucked out, okay? And that it's that it was made to stand and it was give was given a mind that of a of a man. Okay? Then for the second beast, uh, it was actually commanded to arise and to devour. For the third beast, we are told that a dominion was handed or given to it. As to the last beast, we are told that uh, told in the succeeding verses that it was actually killed and its body was actually destroyed. So, with this uh, uh, axe made upon uh, on this beast, shows us that their powers have limitations. Okay, and thirdly, uh, the beast. Uh, tells us that hum fallen human powers are actually temporal. We can see that we can see this uh, in the rise and fall of nations, the succession of nations. Okay, this reminds us that the exercise of fallen human power has an expiration period. Now we do not know when such power will expire, yet it will surely expire according to God's divine timetable. And all of this actually points us to the fact that God's rule extends over fallen human kingdoms to power. Now, God's rule does not just extend over to, human fo to fallen human powers, but it also extends in the installation of a cosmic divine king, as we can read in verses 9 to 14. Okay? In verse 9, uh, as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. As I looked, 
the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned uh, with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now from the vision of the four beasts, Daniel's attention then is shifted to the divine throne room. Again, we are confronted with imageries. And we can also see the apparent contrast between the imageries in verses 8, 1 to 8 and in verses 9 to 14. Okay? There is light, majesty, calmness, and authority in contrast to the violent imagery found in the preceding verses. So what did Daniel see in the divine throne room? Okay. We are actually uh, introduced to two main characters in the divine throne room, namely the Ancient of Days and the, that one like a son of man that he mentioned. Okay. Now, the, Daniel saw that the thrones were actually placed or set now, it symbolizes stability of control and power. Now, you might be wondering who then is the Ancient of Days, no? Well, it's an imagery uh, for God, okay? Uh, especially in his role as a judge, in particular, in this particular, uh, in this particular chapter, okay? We can also see that the Ancient of Days actually took his seat, which implies God's ultimate control and power over the universe. Now, his clothing is described to us as white as snow, which symbolizes the Lord's purity and righteousness. His hair is described as like pure wool, which refers to God's wisdom. The throne is like, likewise, likewise described as like that of a fiery flames. No? We are also told that a stream of fire flowed before God. Now, fire is a com common biblical symbol for God's presence. Hence, God's continuous controlling presence in history is actually symbolized by the said stream of fire. Okay? Further, uh, God being seated on the throne of fire uh, symbolizes His presence in judgment, which was which what uh, we already uh, saw uh, in, in, in particular in verse 10. Uh, which says that the court sat in judgment and the books were open. Now, as Daniel was looking at the glorious image of God sitting in judgment, his attention then was suddenly caught with another event, in particular in verses uh, 11 to 12. In verse 11, uh, I looked then because of the sound of the great words uh, that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. Then in verse 12, as for the rest of the beast, no, their dominion were taken away from them, but and their lives were prolonged, but only for a season of time. His attention was drawn to the to the horn no? uh, of the fourth beast, who actually spoke arrogantly. Then he witnessed the death of, the, of the, the beast, of the fourth beast, and its body being burned in fire. He likewise saw that the dominion of the other beasts, again, were taken. Daniel is then reminded that the ultimate authority does not reside in Babylon, Persia, Greece, or Rome. It resides in the one who sits on the throne. Today, we may think that the solution resides in our government to resolve this pandemic and that man is left alone in his own to resolve the issue. However, this passage tells us that all the situations in the world rest in the hands of the Almighty God. We, may, we might see chaos, 
an increasing number of deaths uh, around us, yet God continues to be in control. And with that, we have to take comfort that the pandemic is within God's control and this pandemic will likewise end. Daniel introduces us to another participant in the divine throne room and that is the one who is like the son of man. In verse 13, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. We are told that this son of man came with the clouds of heaven and that he was able to stand before God who sits in judgment. What then is the occasion that uh, this son of man came? What was the event uh, being witnessed by Daniel? Uh, we are told that uh, the dominion of the beast, the dominion of the world, the kingdom and its glory uh, were given to the son of man. And that consequently all men from every tongues and nations should serve him. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, we are told that the, it is only God who actually rides on clouds. In Psalm 104 verse 3, uh, we are told that uh, he lays the beams of, cha of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariots. He rides on the wings of the wind. And with this in mind, we know for a fact that the Son of Man is not just any human being. He's not just any creature, but he's actually divine. Now, why was he described as a son of man? Well, he was described to be like a son of man in contrast to the human-like characters of the beast mentioned in verses 1 to 8. He is the true man. Who is the son of man that is being referred to by Daniel uh, in this passage? Well, the son of man is none other than Jesus the king of God's everlasting kingdom. In the New Testament, Jesus referred to himself as the son of man. In Mark 14, 26, we read, and Jesus uh, said, I am, and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Okay. What then was this event? Okay. Uh, being referred to in verse 14. Well, the occasion or the event uh, pertains to the ascension of Jesus and his coronation as king of God's everlasting kingdom. He's given dominion, which echoes back to the book of Genesis when Adam was given dominion over creation. The handing of dominion to the Son of Man indicates that he has come to restore humanity's lost dominion over creation. Just as the fallen creation has produced the four, the four beasts which reign on earth for a limited period of time, so the rule of the Son of Man in the restored creation will be eternal. We also have to take note that the kingdom of God has already begun. Nevertheless, there is an inauguration okay, and also a consummation aspect of the kingdom. Then now, but not yet. Okay? With Jesus' first coming, the everlasting kingdom was established. And so the Son of Time is now moving towards the second coming of Jesus to usher in the new creation. The ascension and coronation, and in fact, even the resurrection of Jesus Christ, means that the great saving events which will culminate in the second coming are irresistibly already in its course. His enthronement as he approaches the ancient of days is a sign that nothing can prevent the coming of the kingdom. 
Daniel's vision of the, the divine enthronement reminds us of God's universal rule. It points us to the very heart of God's purposes for the world and humanity, to establish His everlasting kingdom. It points, to the, it points us to the Lord Jesus as King of God's everlasting kingdom in the installation of this divine King, of this cosmic King, God's rule over history is made apparent. God's rule extends over the fallen human kingdom, the power, and in the installation of the divine cosmic king. Again, the key word here is king or a crown. We can also see in verses 15 to, 8, to 28 that God's rule extends in the rendition of a cosmic judgment. And the key word here, children, is rewards. Okay? Let's read verses 15 uh, to 28. Okay? As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head, the ad, and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed uh, the kingdom. Verse 23. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. It shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings shall rise, and another shall rise after them. It shall be different from, one, from the former ones, and shall put down three kings shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear, wear out or wear out the saints of the, the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed. But I kept the matter in my heart. Now, after seeing the horrendous vision of the four beasts and the majestic vision of the divine throne room, Daniel became anxious. He was disturbed by these visions. He was anxious because he was able to see a glimpse of what will happen in the future. He then approached an angelic being who then explained to him the meaning of his vision. So the angel explained to him, that the four beasts actually refers to the four kingdoms and that the, the, that the, uh, uh, the saints of the Most High okay, will uh, receive the, the kingdom and that they will possess the kingdom forever and ever. Okay? The, the, despite the positive uh, explanation given by the, the, the angelic being, no? uh, Daniel continued to be disturbed. Okay? And he wanted to know more about the fourth beast. Okay? That's why in verse 19 he said, I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast. 
which was actually different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze. Okay? Uh, aside from the earlier description of the 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 uh, no no the, the fourth beast no in in verses one to eight now in verse 20 and about 10 horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell and the horn that had eyes and the mouth that spoke great things that seemed uh, greater than its companions as i look this horn uh, made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the ancient of days came to judgment and then uh, the saints of the most high were uh, uh, were given to this uh, horn for a certain period of time no? a time and times and half a time okay so uh, what do we notice in the interpretation given by the uh, the angelic being to, to Daniel. No? Well, first, uh, we can see the, the certainty of judgment of the fourth beast and of the little horn. Okay? We are reminded that the fourth beast is different from the other beast. It is unparalleled in its destructive power. It is different because of its ferocious intention to dominate the whole world and its intention to destroy everything uh, in its path. This suggests a general interpretation no? to all human kingdoms and power. Okay? So the beasts represent kingdoms, okay? while the horns refers to, refer to kings. Okay? The focus of the passage is not so much on the ten horns, but focuses more on the little horns. Okay? Uh, as we have mentioned, uh, the horn symbolizes uh, pride, power, so in this instance, uh, the little horn symbolizes uh, the anti-God or anti-Christ power. He is charged, uh, according to Daniel in the interpretation, uh, the little horn is being charged for, be, for his blasphemy. In verse 25, he speaks words against the Most High. That's his first crime. The second crime is uh, the persecution of the saints. Okay? And his third crime is uh, his self-deification no? uh, because uh, he wanted to change the times and the law. No? In, da in Daniel chapter 2, we learn that it is only the Lord who changes times. Okay? So, and aside from changing the times, he also intends to change the law of God. Okay? He is the epitome of blatant and sinister position against uh, God and his rule in the world. Now, who is this uh, little horn being referred to by uh, Daniel no? in his dream? Uh, the historical reference to the little horn has been also the subject of uh, much discussion. But since uh, we are given a, a general picture of the power of the fourth beast, we can say, as I have already mentioned, we have learned that uh, the little horn uh, refers to the Antichrist power, anti-God power. So, the little horn refer, would ref, now refer to anti-God or anti-Christ in each period of history, culminating to the Antichrist mentioned in the book of uh, Revelation. Okay? So, uh, so those, so that's the, uh, that's about the the little horn. Now, with regard to the to his crime of persecution, of persecuting the saints, the, the text tells us that uh, the saints of the Most High will be given to him uh, for a time, times and half a time, no. Now, this passage uh, has been interpreted by some Christians as referring to the last part or the last, uh, the other half no, of the, uh, the seven years of great tribulation because the first and a half thou, uh, refers to the, the peace to be brought by the Antichrist. And so in the latter half of the seven, of the seven years, 
uh, the Antichrist will now be uh, making its move against uh, the the saints of the, the the saints, no, against the Christians, against the believers. Okay. Uh, now, if you are going to look at your NIV translation, you will see uh, in the footnote that, that it says that it can be that the uh, clause no? uh, times and time and times for half times uh, can be translated as for a year, two years and half a year. Okay? However, in apocalyptic language uh, the, the clause that we find in, uh, in this chapter, in chapter 7 simply means a certain period of time no uh, a certain or a determined period of time given by the lord uh, we are actually given a picture that uh, that uh, how that, that 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 at its inception it was actually very fast okay fastly moving then uh, as it continues to move it move it seems like it's taking forever but all of a sudden it would be cut short and that's the the idea being conveyed by uh the phrase uh uh times no time and times and half times okay that's actually the the idea being conveyed by that apocalyptic language okay? now in verse 26 we are told that uh the little horn okay will be judged and that his dominion uh will be taken away from him and that his body will be consumed and destroyed in the end okay so that's the first thing that we can notice or observe in the interpretation the second thing is that uh we can see the certainty of the victory of the people of god okay we can see this in the awarding of the dominion the kingdom and the glory to the saints of the Most High in verse 27. Okay? Uh, the giving or the rewarding of the dominion has already been mentioned by the uh, angelic being in verse 18. Okay? So we can really see that there's a certainty that uh, the saints of the Most High uh, will receive dominion in the end of history. Likewise, in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 6, we are told that those who are in Christ, okay, in verse 6 of uh, Revelation, chapter 20, it says, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So what practical applications can we draw from the interpretations of the, the vision. But first, we should not be naive about the reality of evil. Daniel's horror and consequent concern for the people of God serves an ex as an example for all of us. We should pray for the persecuted Christians. Now, secondly, we see that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of suffering. Christians will be persecuted as long as they are faithful to the biblical teachings. In facing anti-God philosophies and policies of our society, it will be inevitable for us to experience hardship when we stand our ground. Are we ready to be persecuted or maligned in Facebook or social media because we have opposed those anti-God and anti-Christian policies? And of course, this presupposes that our opposition to them is made with tact, wisdom, and respect. And finally, we can see that we should put our hope on God who sits on the throne and not to worldly powers. We should not make our government leaders as our idols. They are not the solution to our problems. They are only mere instruments that the Lord can use for His glory and for His purpose. In conclusion, 
in chapter 7, we are given a panoramic picture of the history of mankind, especially that of the history of the church. The beast represent the superpowers that will take over the world. However, these empires will go against each other and will be supplanted by the winning empire. Just as the character of the beast reaches its apex in the little horn, so the kingdom of God will reach its climax in the destruction of the Antichrist. Then the kingdom of God will fill the earth. The kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of Christ, and he will rule forever, sharing his rule with his saints. Throughout the chapter, we learn that the kingdom war will war against each other until in the end, only one kingdom will prevail, the eternal kingdom of Christ. God's rule extends over fallen human kingdoms, fallen human powers. We can see that God has installed a cosmic divine king, a king for children, as their keyword. And his rule extends in the rewarding and rewarding to the saints and rendition of judgment against the enemies of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that uh, our hope, our will be shaken, Lord God, when we put them on the wrong place and on the wrong person. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us that uh, hope should be placed on you, Lord, because you are in control of everything. May you grant us, Lord, the, the power, Lord, to stand against oppression and persecution, Lord God, when the time comes. And may you also enable us, Lord, to look beyond our circumstances and to look unto the Lord Jesus Christ, who reigns in, in heaven. Thank you, Father. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We will continue uh, we, uh, with our worship as we uh, respond uh, to God's to God's word. Okay. We will be singing. Uh, Jesus uh, shall reign. Jesus shall reign wherever the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom spread from shore to shore till moon shall rise. strong to crown his head his name lights with perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice people and realms of every tongue Dwell on his love with sweetest song, and infant voices shall proclaim their early blessings on his name. Blessings above wherever he reigns, the prisoner leaves to lose his change, the weary find eternal rest, and all the sons of want are blessed. Where he displays his healing power, 
Death and the curse are known no more. In him the tribes of Adam boast. More blessings than their fathers lost. Let every creature rise and bring his grateful honors to our King. Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the Lord. Amen. We will continue our worship as we pray the pattern prayer that the Lord taught his disciples to pray, the Lord's Prayer. I invite all of you to pray with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We are now in the confessing our faith portion of our worship. We will be reciting the Apostles' Creed, an old creed that uh, teaches a biblical teaching and connects us to the early church. So, Pilgrim Community Church, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son. Our Lord was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We'll now be singing our closing song entitled, The Church's One Foundation. I invite all of you to sing with me. Okay. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride with his own blood he bought her and for her life he died elect from every nation yet one for all the earth her charter of salvation one Lord, one faith, one birth, one holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food, and to one hope she presses with every grace and good. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with the vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed. And the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Yet she on earth had union with God the three in one, and mystics with communion with those whose rest is one. Oh, happy ones and holy, 
Lord, give us grace that we like them, the meek and lowly, in love may dwell with Thee. The Lord also intends to bless all of you with His good word, the benediction. So, let us now prepare our hearts as we receive God's uh, good word, His benediction. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now blessed be the Lord our God, the God of Israel, for He alone that wondrous works in glory that excel. And blessed be His glorious name to all eternity. The whole earth let His glory fill. Amen, so let it be. This is a time when our formal worship comes to an end after some time of worship and meditation. Have a blessed Lord's Day to all of you.